Welcome to chapter 22, Ecosystem Ecology. So this chapter in your book is focusing on bison, American bison, and how they are a keystone species in the environment in which they live, which is the American prairie. And they're also kind of doing it within the context of this controversial plan that is being put together by conservationists and being opposed by ranchers, farmers, all sorts of people in the public um, that are planning to rewild the American prairie. So learning objectives for this chapter are one, to understand what ecosystems are and how keystone species affect ecosystems. Two, understand how nutrients, water, and energy move through ecosystems. And three, understand how biomes are characterized. So let's start off with what is an ecosystem? I'm sure all of you have heard the word ecosystem and you probably have some idea, but an ecosystem is all the living organisms in an area and the non-living components of the environment with which they interact. So it's this whole interwoven network um, in addition to whatever is actually living there, it also includes physical conditions like temperature, moisture, light, chemical resources that are in the soil, the water, the air. Um, it's all sorts of things and it's a very dynamic system. So it's never necessarily the same, it's never static. So when we talk about an ecosystem, we have both biotic, which is living, and abiotic, which is non-living components, right? So some of the biotic components, you have all of the plants, animals, and microorganisms, microorganisms as well. So microorganisms that are living in the soil, um, all, all sorts of things. Um, and broadly, these can fall into two categories, right, which we know a little bit about. We have autotrophs, which are our producers. Those are the ones that can get energy from the sun and don't need anything else for their energy. So they're not consuming other food. They're at the bottom of the food chain, right? And then we have our heterotrophs, who do not produce um, energy from the sun. They cannot photosynthesize. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a few chapters. But these are the guys that are getting energy from the food that they eat lower on the food chain, which can include producers like autotrophs, or it could be other consumers, depending on how far up they are. Okay, now we get to the abiotic or the non-living components. So there's lots of different things that can go into an ecosystem, right, and kind of influence the habitat um, or the biome that they're in, which we'll talk about here. So. Abiotic is sunlight, temperature, precipitation, topography, terrain, soil, all sorts of things. Anything that you can think of that is physical, again, could be chemical resources in the soil, possibly the water or the air. Um, all of those things are abiotic in an ecosystem. So your book has this really, really good um, infographic here, and I would suggest looking at it. it is more specific to the example in your book about the American bison living on the American prairie. Um, so we have all of our biotic factors over here and our abiotic factors over here. So again, biotic, like just to give you some examples, we have our plants, we have our burrowing mammals, we have our birds, our reptiles, amphibians, our insects, all of our pollinators, our bees. Um, and then non-living, so these are things that specifically also characterize this habitat, right? Or this biome, which we'll talk about here. So like moderate temperature, anywhere from negative 22 degrees to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, moderate rainfall. The soil that's here is very characteristic, but that is also a non-living abiotic factor. So we're gonna talk about these different habitats and just kind of foreshadowing what's going to happen in chapter 23 about global climate change. When we're talking about a habitat, a habitat is the physical environment where an organism lives and to what it's adapted to. So climate changes you may, may already know or you might guess can obviously alter habitat. So this is an example and we will get much more into it in the next chapter, but just to kind of get you thinking, this is an example of um, maple trees. Right, so in the red here, I think is where you can see the maple and birch trees were in the past, so from 1960 to 1990. And because we're experiencing, on average, warmer temperatures, now, well, actually, it doesn't really show you now, but now it's like a little bit more up here. So it's just gradually moving north. And then you can kind of see that everything is shifting 
north. So these dark green here, the oak pine, oak hickory, are all now going to be dominating far more northern forests. And our maple is going to be essentially wiped out from the U.S. most likely and possibly into Canada, depending on, you know, how how warm we go and how much the temperature changes. But when we're talking about these American bison in particular, climate change can also affect their habitat. Um, a lot of things that we see, right, are have to do with like wildfires when we're looking at grasslands or even some forests. Um, especially where there's only moderate rainfall and it can get pretty warm. Um, but this is what we're talking about when we're talking about their specific habitat. And we'll get more into climate change at a later time too. So now looking at the bigger picture, we see what their habitat is, but a biome is kind of a larger picture of that. So a biome is a large geographic area defined by its characteristic plant life and it's determined by things like temperature and rainfall. Okay. So there's roughly 10 different kinds of biomes um, in the world, and we'll go over those in just a second here. But again, it's a very large area. So there are some pretty good um, infographics in your book that you might want to look at. I know they might be kind of hard to read on here, but you can see the climate data um, for a typical deciduous forest, right? So we can look at the month, we can look at the temperature. Um, temperate, right, they're staying kind of, they're not really going to far extremes, okay? Um, and this is kind of an example from the maple, maple trees that we just talked about, their habitat. So when we're talking about biomes, biomes, again, are, are reflective of climatic factors, right? So temperature and rainfall, and that's what shapes life in each one of these, and that's what you know, we have different regions of the globe and we have different biomes. You can see here um, a map of the world and you can see color coded here are, I believe there's 10, 2, 4, 6, 8, oh, there's only 8 here. Um, but I think there we categorize around 10. 8 are kind of our most common ones. The other two are kind of almost subcategories of biomes. But here we go. Um, we've got all of these different biomes here and you can see where they land in the world, right? And the way that these differences reflect is actually a reflection of how the sun shines more. So obviously we know the equator is warm, right? And then as we move towards the poles, whether we go south or whether we go north, we're getting colder. And you're gonna see this too when we ta start talking about evolution um, and evolution of skin color. Um, but the reason for this, right, is when we talk about the sun and how it reflects on the earth. So when the sun is hitting directly, that's when we're at the equator, and then it's hitting at different angles as you move towards the poles. So as the sun angle is changing, so is the temperature, right? So we're going from tropical zones near the equator down to temperate and then Arctic zones on either pole. So we're getting colder as we go towards the poles, and that's obviously changing a lot of things. It's changing the temperature, it's changing the amount of sun, um, and that changes depending on the season as well, obviously, but we can see temperate climates here that are kind of in the, are, um, sorry, up, up right before we get to Arctic zones. Um, they have moderate temperatures, pretty regular rainfall. Arctic climates are really cold, really dry, long, dark winters. And then the opposite, right? Their summer is 24, 24 hour sun, basically. And then the tropical climates, kind of like what we're living in here, um, have high temperatures, areas closest to the equator also have higher rainfall. So that's when you start thinking about like the Amazon um, rainforest and things like that and how much rainfall they're getting, um, just as an example. So with this different temperature, with this different rainfall, we get different types of vegetation. And with different types of vegetation, obviously we get different types of life that are involved as well. Um, so here are the different biomes here. You can take a look again, this infographic is in your book. I know it's a little bit difficult to read here. So these are the eight here. Um, and then the two that are kind of subsets and a little bit more specific, obviously, are savanna and Mediterranean. We don't hear about those as often as we do these other eight, but we have taiga, um, which is characterized by evergreen trees, long and cold winters, only short summers. You can see it's right here, kind of in the subarctic border, um, right between temperate and subarctic. Okay, um, tundra is right above that. That's when we're actually getting to the Arctic. That's our coldest spot. Uh, that's 
only in the Arctic mountain regions, and it's characterized by very low growing vegetation, permafrost soil, um, very close to the surface of the soil as well. So there are still a lot of things that can live in Arctic tundra um, and Arctic biomes, but it is obviously just very different from if you are closer to the equator and you have different kinds of vegetation and rainfall temperatures, etc. Um, going into the temperate zone, we have temperate deciduous forests, so characterized by moderate winters and rainfall, mostly evergreen or deciduous um, trees are going to be dropping their leaves in the winter. So that's where you get the nice like fall colors and then it turns into kind of a barren wasteland for winter. Um, we also have temperate grasslands. So perennial grasses, other non-woody plants. So this is what the American bison are on, right? The prairies are a really good example here. Um, and then getting a little bit warmer, right? We go into the desert. Um, I'm from the desert, so I have a fond place in my heart for this biome, but uh, extreme dryness, right? So we're getting very little rainfall here and they can still experience really cold winters, but on the flip side, they're also getting really hot summers, okay? Um, so like I said, these are kind of two subset ones. Um, this is still in the temperate region, the Mediterranean, long, hot, dry summers, cool, damp winters. Um, plant life is very characteristic of that, but obviously we're looking in one specific place for this and kind of the same with savanna, right? Um, savanna, we're obviously going a little bit closer to the equator. We're getting hotter. Um, we're getting a little bit more dry, um, but we're not quite as dry as the desert. So you can see here decreasing moisture as well. But um, again, warm temperatures, and then they really have two different seasons. They have a really dry season and a really rainy season. Um, and if you've ever watched documentaries about animals looking for like watering holes, you can see that like sometimes they have a really easy time during the wet season and during the dry season, it's like they're walking for hundreds of miles sometimes. So these are the different biomes, the different vegetation um, that characterize them. The last two are aquatic. So we either have marine, so saltwater or freshwater, right? Um, so freshwater lakes, rivers, streams, ponds, that kind of thing. And then aquatic marine would obviously be anything in the oceans, okay? Um, and or estuaries. We're still talking about estuaries when we're talking marine since they are still pretty salty um, or brackish water. So talking about all those biomes, now we're going to kind of flip, and this is a little bit opposite of the way your book goes, but to me, it just makes a little bit more sense to tell you about how we characterize what the habitat and what the larger biome is for some of these animals. And then we start getting into what makes that biome a biome, and then slowly getting into what's actually living there. So we're going to talk really quick about the water cycle, because obviously water has a great deal to deal with. Um, or to do with the amount of vegetation in an area, as well as the amount of precipitation, right? Um, so we'll kind of go over the water cycle a little bit here so that you can kind of understand. But obviously in the Great Plains, uh, it's, it's just like elsewhere, it's directly reflective of the moisture in the air as it passes over that area. So airflow in the plains, for example, tends to be pretty dry, right? There's not very much... Um, air that's flowing west to east across the plains. So it kind of limits the amount of rainfall. And that's because um, you don't get any water vapor if it does come from the side of the Rocky Mountains, when we're talking about the plains specifically. But for the water cycle, the water cycle is just a continuous movement of water on, above, and below the Earth's surface. So you can see, again, a pretty good infographic here. And there's a lot of pretty good animations in your book as well. So as you're reading through this, um, if you're more of a video kind of person, I would click these animations. They are pretty good. I think they're, I think there's one for water cycle. There's definitely one for the nitrogen cycle and phosphorus cycle, which we'll talk about here in a second as well. Um, but when we're talking about the water cycle, it's just like any other cycle, right? So there's no beginning, there's no end. It's just going kind of in stages. And sometimes these stages are a little bit blurred. Um, right. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a chicken or the egg sort of thing. It's not necessarily that one is coming before the other in our case, but we have different places to store water. So obviously we've got water in the oceans. We also have fresh water in lakes, ponds, whatever. 
Um, but we also have groundwater, and then we also have aquifers. So aquifers are just an underground layer of porous rock that also has water. It's down deeper than the groundwater. Um, it's actually staying in that rock and staying in that area, whereas groundwater will eventually leach into rivers or lakes um, that'll eventually flow down into the ocean. So this is why when it rains really hard here, right, our groundwater um, and everything else that's kind of on the surface is all flowing straight into the ocean. That's why we get the brown water advisories because all the junk that's up here, our trash, our um, pesticides, our dirt, whatever it might be, is all just flowing straight into the ocean with heavy rainfall, okay? So this is all part of the water cycle. So first we've got water storage and what's happening is the water is evaporating. That's then forming clouds from those clouds, then once they're kind of full of water, right, is when we're gonna get precipitation. Uh, the precipitation is going to water everything it needs to, right? So depending on if we've got a really deciduous forest, if we've got a desert, savanna, no matter what biome we're in, um, it's going to do what it needs to do, but then it's gonna start seeping into the ground and that's when it's actually available for all the plants to take up um, whatever moisture it needs. And then it's gonna go down into the groundwater and then deeper into these underwater aquifers as well, okay? The water that's not absorbed is also gonna just run off into, you know, lakes, rivers, ocean, whatever is around there basically and form larger bodies of water, which is why, you know, we see the ebb and flow of bodies of water change with different seasons and different amounts of precipitation. Okay. So now that we kind of understand where these bison are living um, and how we characterize their habitat on a smaller scale, not a bigger scale, their biome, um, now we're gonna actually go into these American bison and them living on the American prairie and what that has done for the American prairie. So these are herbivorous, large mammals. What one point in time, there was as many as 30 million. And you can see here, this is a photo of these people standing on top of hundreds, thousands of bison skulls. So bisons were once um, hunted. There, there's been all sorts of, of things that have really kind of caused the demise of bison, um, but hunting was, was the major one, um, whether it was for food or just, you know, for, for trophy killing essentially, which is kind of what this looks like, right? Um, so we got down to fewer than 500 by the 1890s. And then today we've actually made a pretty good comeback, obviously nowhere near 30 million, um, but today we're closer to half a million. So we're getting up there and people are working really hard um, to conserve the prairies and to hopefully get this bison population back a little bit. But why are bison important? Why do we care if they disappear, right? Well, every every animal, every every organism in an ecosystem has its niche. It has what it's, you know, what it's responsible for. And we talked about bees last time being a keystone species and bison are also a keystone species. So as a reminder, a keystone species is just a species on which other species depend on. So if you remove this species, this is, I think we, we've seen this with bees too, right? But the same thing is with bees. Bees are another great example of a keystone species, a very common one that you'll hear about. But if you remove this, it's like removing the top, um, the top of an arc. And it's kind of a support structure that once it's gone, you, it's going to be really hard to get it back and everything else is just going to crumble. So again, this is a really good infographic that you can read here. Um, but bison are in the American prairie, they're the ecosystem engineers, right? So they're constantly grazing on grass, they're promoting growth of other plant species, which also promotes a healthy insect population. Um, their grazing patterns are also creating kind of an ideal habitat for prairie chicken as an example. Um, so because there's less grazing now that we actually have less prairie chickens. Um, because prairie chickens actually mate in the area that's really well grazed by the bison. And then they move to the higher areas of grass um, to, you know, do everything else to raise their young and kind of, you know, protect from predators. But they need that area cleared so that they can actually mate. So because of this, because they're finding less and less of this area, 
they're not able to do their mating dances and mating calls um, and get with each other. And we have less and less prairie chicken as time goes on too. Um, their bison are also food for predators, scavengers, and they also keep other, um, you know, other things in check because they're grazing through the grass. So without these bison, obviously, everything that we saw here, every everything that they're engineering in the environment is pretty much gone. To some extent, you have other um, organisms or animals that can step up to the plate here, but really it's, it's very difficult. So without grazing, um, our grasses become overgrown, uh, the prairie dogs are less abundant, um, nutrients are just locked up in the grass um, litter and they're not really able to seep into the ground or go into different places. There's less diversity in the plants, so we have less pollinators. All of those issues come to light just because we've removed bison. So obviously this is a big deal. Bison are really, really important in this biome, in this ecosystem. Okay. And again, part of the reason we talk about that is through something called nutrient cycling. And bison are a huge part of nutrient cycling in the American prairie. So when we talk about nutrient cycling, it's just, you can see the definition here, it's the movement of atoms of nutrients as they cycle between different molecules and living organisms and the environment. So we're, we're talking about different things, right? And the most important nutrients that we have for living organisms are nitrogen, and we'll talk about the nitrogen and phosphorus cycle here in a second, as well as the carbon cycle, which you'll hear a little bit more about probably in our climate change lecture. Um, but without this nutrient cycling, you have limited availability of all of these nutrients and limited availability means that certain things aren't able to take them up right so then we don't have decomposers we don't have consumers we don't have producers that are able to take these nutrients and use them in their own processes to live so the two cycles that we're really going to talk about here are the nitrogen cycle and the phosphorus cycle. Again, we'll get a little bit more into carbon probably in the climate change lecture because that has, you know, obviously with carbon, we've got a lot of things that we like to talk about with climate change. But uh, nitrogen cycle and phosphorus cycle are equally as important, if not more important to some. Um, so we'll talk about those and how those nutrients cycle through the environment. So obviously the way the nitrogen is moving through the environment is how we get the nitrogen cycle. Uh, nitrogen is a really critical component of amino acids that make up different proteins as well as different nucleotides in your DNA and RNA. We're getting into proteins and DNA, RNA into the next chapter, um, but just know that nitrogen is a key component of that. And you'll find that out even more so once we get into it. But the way that these nitrogen atoms cycle between different chemical and biochemical compounds um, it goes through different phases in soil, air, water, um, and kind of converts to different things. And again, chicken or the egg with some of these, right, um, until we get to evolution. Um, but we've got, we've got different things that are happening. So we have nitrogen recycling bacteria in soil. Um, we have nitrogen gas in two in the air, which makes up 80% of the atmosphere, but and you'll see this with things like CO2, it doesn't mean that it's a bioavailable gas. So it, it's not something that animals can necessarily just pick up the nitrogen in the air um, and they're automatically converting this nitrogen into something that's useful. So in order to get this nitrogen to a place that's actually useful, these plants are relying on nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the soil. Right, so we've got to have the nitrogen fixing bacteria here. Um, they are then converting that gaseous nitrogen that into into a form that plants can actually take up and use, which is ammonia. Um, so that's combining with hydrogen, it's NH3. We've heard about ammonia, right? You hear about it like in your pee or in different, um, you know, there's different concentrations of it. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It really depends on the level and where you're talking about. But in this case, we really need to convert that into up here in the atmosphere into this NH3. So these nitrogen fixing bacteria are really important. The plant is then going to bring up that ammonia in through their roots. And then obviously anything eating those plants, like say bison, are getting those molecules in the plants um, into their body through consuming it. 
Uh, there's also a natural fertilizer from animal waste has ammonia. Decomposers like bacteria and fungi are also a producer of ammonia. Um, but we're, we're having nitrogen flow through this whole system. And then, you know, once the bison dies, whether it's being eaten and then some other animal is consuming that nitrogen in the bison, or on the flip side, we have decomposers that are, are getting that ammonia available from that animal. And then nitrogen gas is returned to the air from the soil through actions of other bacteria as well. So it's just going in this full cycle and you know we're not really losing any of it through any step. It's just moving into a different phase. Same with the phosphorus cycle. So again, phosphorus is really critical for the structure of nucleic acids um, and phospholipids, which go into like cell membranes and things like that. Uh, again, more into the next unit. But in animals, um, they really need it for things like their bones, their teeth, and it's it's added to the ecosystem mostly by weathering rocks or through human activities, which human activities, give or take, are not always the best thing. Um, we're starting to realize that a little bit more now, but still kind of iffy. <laughs> but basically, um, phosphorus is coming into the soil through the weathering of different rocks. The plants take up this phosphorus through their roots. And then animals eat these plants. They in turn obviously obtain the phosphorus. And then when the plants and animals die, phosphorus is returned to the cycle or returned to the soil. And that's kind of the whole cycle of phosphorus. So as we're talking about these nutrient cycling, now it's time to talk about how energy is flowing through an ecosystem. Energy, unlike nutrients is flowing through a system, which means that we're losing it as we flow through an ecosystem. Nutrients, however, are like we said, recycled. So they're going through a cycle and they're just in different stages of what that nutrient actually looks like, but it pretty much always exists um, in the same form. And we're not really losing it too much in, in different stages. Energy, on the other hand, is flowing one way. So when we look at a food pyramid, let's say, and we're thinking about a food chain, energy, keep in mind, is stored in the molecules of an animal. Okay, so when one animal eats another animal, all of that energy stored is now available for that consumer. But think about this, even, even in your own personal life, when you eat something, you're not getting 100% of the nutrients that are in that, right? So our producers here, so let's say, for example, our grasses. Our grasses have all of that ammonia and phosphorus that they're sucking up from the soil. And then we have a prairie dog or a bison comes and grazes on that grass. Is that primary consumer, our little herbivore here, getting 100% of those nutrients? No, they're actually only getting about 10% of it. Almost 90% of that energy is lost and it's lost to mostly heat. Um, you'll, you'll hear about that even if you ever take physics or chemistry, right? So most of that energy is lost to heat, uh, also waste, right? Same thing with us, right? We, we have a high metabolism. Well, some of us have a high metabolism, um, but we have a metabolism nonetheless. Uh, we're losing things to heat. We also have waste. So we're losing about 90% with that first step. So each each one that we go up, basically, we're going up only by 10%. And then we get into the higher and we're still losing 90% with each step. So then we're only getting to about 1%. So this is one of the reasons why we don't see very much apex predators, because we, as an ecosystem, the ecosystem cannot support that many apex predators. We don't have the energy to do it, right? Um, and that's because we're losing so much energy through each step. Um, as a primary consumer, we've only got 10% of the nutrients that we got from these plants down here, our grasses, let's say. And then we have a, a predatory bird or whatever the apex predator is in that ecosystem is coming down, eating our primary consumer. And now they're only getting 1% of the nutrients that were in this guy because, again, 90% of it, um, or sorry, 9% of it because we've only got 10%, but it's 90% as a whole. Um, the majority of that is still lost to metabolism, heat, waste, um, other byproducts that are happening 
um, as a result of living, essentially. So we're losing tons and tons of energy as we flow through the ecosystem and as we go up the food chain. So to kind of round it, round it all out and finish up the chapter, uh, you know, hopefully this illustrates a little bit about why bison are so important, why they're such a keystone species in the American prairie. And, you know, they're one of the reasons it, it doesn't just have to do with energy, but they're, they're huge nutrient cyclers. Um, again, the energy flow through an ecosystem, they're, they're a primary consumer. So they're, they're a really good thing to have in an ecosystem. Um, we lose apex predators and obviously we have top down effects and we have issues that come from that but not quite like we do when we lose at a lower level, especially, okay? Um, but to kind of round out your chapter, I, I didn't really get into um, the controversy behind what they're trying to do, and I'll, I'll let you read up about that if you would like, but it's basically they're trying to make more conservation land, and then you have people um, like ranchers in Northern Montana um, that are really, really against it and part of it is because you you have someone from silicon valley um who is pushing this and you know there's pros and cons to every conservation initiative and this is something i would love for you to take away from this class is uh, things aren't always black and white right like yeah a hundred percent why would we not want to conserve bison of course we want to conserve bison but then you look at it and be because we're conserving bison, the people that are in this area that don't really have very many bison that have cattle, let's say, they're not super excited about that native wildlife coming back because it means more predators are going to come back. And it means that these free roaming bison might actually be eating more of their stuff and not allowing the cattle to graze as much. So there's a lot of issues on both sides. It's not always really an easy decision, even though obviously we're like, of course we should bring bison back because we destroyed them. Um, but it's conservation is a tricky one and it's something that we're still navigating and still trying to perfect and will probably never be perfected because we, you know, we humans just can't intervene <laughs> to some extent. But uh, again, more of that is in your book if you want to read up on it and what they're trying to do with these American bison. But that's kind of rounding out the whole thing, um, the whole story of the American bison as a really important keystone species that we almost brought to extinction and are now slowly trying to, to bring back to try to help out that whole ecosystem.